All right, welcome to the Jazz Funeral School podcast where we have one mission and that is to help as many interested people around the world as possible get better and improve at jazz piano by providing structured and organized and directional jazz piano education. My name is Brennan Lowe. I'm your host as always and thank you so much for joining me today. So this is going to be episode number 75 and this is going to be on the mathematics and movements of improvisation. Now, one quick thing. I, get a, I like to appease my audience, right? So uh, people who watch on YouTube, you know, I know obviously there's trolls out there, but some people are like, Brendan, I just want to see the lesson. You know, I understand that. I have no problem with that. That's, that's fine. You don't want to hear about my life. That's no problem. You just want to learn jazz piano. That's why I'm doing this, right? So if you just want the lesson video from here on out, you can go in, click on the link in the show notes below, and you will be taken to the podcast page on our website where there will be an edited version of the lesson. So I won't do all the, you know, all the intro and fluff stuff talking about what's new in JPS, what's coming up. You won't hear any of that. You'll just get to hear, excuse me, the lesson. And I'll start right from when I go into the episode. With that being said, go there now (laughs) if you just want to watch the episode. All right. So that took about 15, 20 seconds. But anyway, again, thank you guys so much for joining me. For those of you who actually want to uh, listen a little bit before I dive into this episode, um, I'm very, very thankful today uh, to be doing this. And I saw Diane Reeves and Peter Martin, and they were just fantastic. I, I, uh, it was just amazing. And I loved, I loved the, the thing I noticed most about that. And I've been seeing a lot of shows lately, which is really nice. It's really good to get out there and, and, you know, everyone is different. Everyone has a different vibe. And a lot of people, you know, I don't like the, when I was in school, I don't like the whole, the whole judgy atmosphere of music just really bothered me. I'm just not that type of person to be like, you know, it's very ego based, right? Oh, who's better? Like, oh, you're better. Oh, you can't do this. Well, I can do that here. Let me play, you know, let me sit down and show off. Like there's so much of that in, in music and jazz. I, I just really don't like that. Like, oh, you're terrible at jazz, you know, or, or you're just a beginner. You, you stink, you know, like that stuff's so, I don't know. It's just, it seems very archaic to me. I mean, when you're going to sit down and play, if you're a beginner and you're having fun, that's all that matters, you know? And I think so many people put other people down, or I see this happen a lot in music. And it's like, why? Does that make you feel better? You know, why, why are you telling this person, you know, they stink? Uh, you know, because they're just clearly not, you know, they don't have the experience you do or, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they didn't get the right education. But anyway, uh, so, you know, it's really nice to see, you know, different shows um, and go out there no matter what skill level you're at and because they provide different atmospheres. And I saw Branford Marcellus with uh, Joey Calderazzo and um, and uh, Kurt Elling at Yoshi's uh, a couple of weeks ago, that was fantastic, and I then I saw Diane Reeves with Peter Martin. Peter Martin's fantastic pianist. Um, I'm actually going to try and get him on to Jazz Piano School coming up very soon uh, to do some education because he is phenomenal. Obviously, he has his uh, website out there too as well, and some two some um, podcast videos um, there. But uh, yeah, the atmospheres and environments they were creating were just fantastic, and it was nothing. the The thing I loved was that it was nothing complicated right they were doing such simple things to create a vibe a mood you know a groove and that to me was it was about making the music right it, it was just it's it was amazing to hear that and not making things crazy or trying to do too much it was just so it was a fantastic show I'm just whenever I see really good shows it's so inspiring right that's why it's so great to get out and hear music um, it's very inspiring uplifting motivated so I feel very motivated after seeing that show. But anyway, here we are at episode number 75. And in this episode, I I recently, in the past couple of weeks, I've heard a lot about improv. And students have been talking to me and I've heard just, you know, various things. And and from out throughout my career too, you know, I never had any much solid advice on improv until I got to college. And even then it was still kind of a a guessing game. But I want to kind of debunk or take a mathematical approach to improv to show you exactly what is going on, right? When, when improv is happening. And I mean, obviously there's a lot going on, 
right? There is a lot going on theoretically wise, you know, modes, scales, cores, blah, blah, blah. But I want to try and really break it down for you by like step by step. So you can see, you know, it's one thing when you put on an album, you're like, you know, if you listen to Art Tatum, well, I, I still listen. This is how you can tell how great they are. I, I still listen to Art Tatum. I'm like, wow, I, I have, you know, what is he even doing? I'm, there's like, that's just nuts, you know? But, you know, some bebop players, like, uh, you know, bebop lines and things like that, they're not, it may feel like you listen to the album and you're like, I could never do that. But you can. You can. And in this episode, I want to show you what exactly is going on in improv when everything's happening, everything's going by so quickly and show you how you can start to tackle that. And just so you have an understanding of it, once you can kind of see it and believe it and understand it and know how to get to that point, then it's much more accomplishable, right? When you have a map, you have some structure to get there. You can actually be like, oh, wow, I can actually do this. And that's what I want you to feel. I want you to have that feeling rather than listening to an album, be like having no clue what they're playing, having no belief that you can actually get to that point ever in your entire life because it's just not true, all right? So here we go. Uh, one other thing too, I appreciate all the uh, reviews too uh, from people who, who did that, so thank you very much. Um, when you're starting improv, right? When you're playing improv, so many people will start out and it might sound like this. Um, this is just a two, five, one in the key of B flat. Okay. It might be like, or let me see. I'm, I'm going to do a, a three, six, two, five, one. So it'll sound like this one, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Right. So, wow, my volume was up super high there. Sorry about that. So I don't know if you noticed, but the beginning portion of the line, right? I just started out something like that. And then, so basically I had a, I was kind of like fumbling and then I had a lick and I like put it right in the spot where I had to play it. And so many people start off with this like this, and I think the majority of all improvisation, people who learn improv are teaching improv like this. Now, I, I believe this is where I kind of rub against the grain in jazz improv education in some ways. So I believe in licks. I believe in, trans, in transcribing, right? So many people, and that's absolutely necessary. You absolutely have to do that. But... In the beginning, you still, just by learning licks, you still don't really understand how to improvise. All you're doing is copying what someone else has played before. You're not learning the vocab, really. I mean, you're learning sentences. I mean, it, it, it's one thing, again, it, I like to relate it back to learning a language. When you are uh, learning a language... <clears throat> Right, you learn. You have to learn the structure of the language. I mean, if for me to, I can learn. I'm I'm gonna go to France soon, hopefully this summer, and and I'm kind of touching up on my French, right? I can say, you know, I can learn to say like "où est le toilette," right? So where's the bathroom, right? Now, do I know the sentence structure uh, of that? No, I just know that that means where is the bathroom. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's a, I mean, I hope that's kind of a good analogy, but it's kind of funny in the same way. Or if I wanted to say, you know, je parle pas, or excuse me, je parle français, right? I speak French. I don't really. But for me to want to say I don't speak French, I need to know what the verb is. I need to know uh, how to make that a negative sentence. You know, put the ne and the pa after the verb, before and after. Je ne parle pas, pas français, right? I'm terrible at French. I don't speak French. But I'm just trying to brush up so I can say a little couple things while I'm there. But anyway, if I were just to copy that and not be taught that the ne and the pa goes around the verb, and that means it's it, it makes the verb negative, and and I have to know that the parle is the like parler is the verb that ma matches with je, and I have to conjugate it right. So I say je parle instead of je parle, right? So all these things are happening, whereas I can learn to say. You know, I speak French or I don't speak French just by just by listening to someone and and saying it, right? If someone said, je parle français, I could be like, and they go, that means I speak French. I'd be like, oh, okay, je parle français, I speak French. And they go, this is how you say it. I don't speak French. Je ne parle 
pa français, right? And then I would learn it. But am I really learning it? I'm not really learning it. And so I want to help you guys right now. And I'm talking a lot. I'm a, I want to help you guys get past that of just copying licks and, and, and putting them into your playing. And because I want you to make it your own. And at, after a certain point, you'll get to the point where you know how to do, how to speak on the piano, but now you can listen to the greats and you can actually understand what they're doing and you can take what they're doing and fit it in. So it's not just like a copy and paste thing. You can, you can make it your own, right? And that's about learning the freedom of jazz. And I think it's just completely flip flop. When people start out, they're just learning all these licks, but they're not learning like how it fits into any of the tools and anything else like that. And I think that it's it has to be flip flop. You, you have to understand the structure first of how to improvise, which I'm going to teach you right now. And then then you start to transcribe and see how other people are doing it. Right? Then you listen to other people, you know, speak French very fluently and understand the minute details of what they're saying in order to make the language sound great. Right? So here we go. If during we have chord tones in a chord for a C minor 7, right? And we have the notes in between, right? And I know you guys have listened to my, probably uh, my bebop, how to approach bebop, and I'm going to be talking about approaches and things like that. The chord tones make up the harmonies. So in its simplest version, when you go to solo, you want to land and target chord tones, Right? Everyone knows that I've, I've said it on my podcast lots and lots of times. Excuse me. And you want to do that by landing on chord tones on the downbeats of changes. So if I have a 2-5-1, every time the chord changes, I want to land on a chord tone. And the reason that sounded like a melody that I just played is because I was I landed on a chord tone every time, right? So seven, three, three. Okay, I could do it a different way. It's all of everything you play, if you were targeting chord tones, you're gonna make melodies out of that. That's where melodies come out of. And to sound melodic and to sound like our improv is connecting over through the harmonies written in a tune, we need to hit the chord tones on downbeats. And again, there's so much more that goes into it, but at a bottom line, that's what needs to happen. Now, we connect the chord tones using our modes. This is why modes are so important because they're going to tell you what notes you can use in the scale to connect your chord tones. If I'm playing a C minor seven, I know I have four chord tones that I can use. If I do not know the mode, then I might play this. Or excuse me. Right? That I might think that all those notes I can connect the chord tones with. Now again, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be the one to tell you can't because you know sometimes I just play random notes because I like the way they sound. But anyway, building up from the bottom to that point, right? You want to know the basics, you want to know the foundation. So your Dorian mode, right? That's your Dorian mode. I'm not going to go into the modes here, but you would learn your mode that fits with that chord. So now I know I can connect my chord tones using these three notes in between my chord tones, right? So if you really think about a mode, you're only learning three new notes in the mode because you already have your chord tones. You get your chord tones, and then you have your three connection notes. So you're not learning like a whole scale, right? That's why chords are so important. Chord scale harmony is very, very interrelated, right? So you're only learning three new notes to connect that go fit in between your chord tones. So now if I were to just solo on C minor 7, I can use these three notes to connect my chord tones. So on all that whole line, I landed on downbeats, uh, excuse me, I landed on chord tones on every downbeat. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and 1. I just, that was different, obviously, but I wanted to demonstrate that. So, 
Now we use the connection notes, okay? So if we turn this into a two, five, one now, that's what I'm trying to do, okay, essentially. So I have my chord tones, I have my modes, and I know uh, that I'm, I'm using the connection notes in between to hit my chord tones. Now the thing about this is you need to learn this so well and so it's it's very important to learn inversions because you need to know you can't just think about your chord tones going from here to here right if you only can envision your chord tones on the piano like this and like this then what if you want to go to a chord tone from here and you want to go to the a the third of f right it's only a half step down but if you learn just your root position voicings you're gonna think oh i can't, I can't uh, the only way i can get to a is by jumping down here Right, so that's why inversions are so important because they're gonna allow you to voice lead your chord tones uh, smoothly. So when you're improvising, right, and lead into each other. Now, here's the mathematical approach. <clears throat> no matter what note we play, and no matter how we want to do it, there's always a way to get to the chord tone on the downbeat and this is where approaches come in and the approaches actually make your sound your your playing sound like bebop right and the approach notes i'm talking about are just the surrounding notes to chord tones so a simple approach that i've talked about before is chord scale above going down to the chord tone and then half step below Those are called approaches, right? Because they approach the chord tone. Now, technically, you can approach a note however you want. If I wanted to approach this E flat from A, I could go all the way down chromatically, right? Now, the other thing about approaches is that they, they tie in rhythmically. Now, remember, we don't want to just hit chord tones on any beats. We want to hit chord tones on down beats. So if I want to approach this E flat from A, one and two and three and four that works because the rhythmic duration in in math of me starting on a and moving down to e flat led me to play this e flat on a downbeat if i started on b flat one and two and three and four and i'm going to be hitting the e flat on an upbeat hitting chord tones on upbeats does not make your improv sound good okay and again this is these fine you, you might think oh well you know it doesn't matter that much this matters listen guys <laughs> this matters more than i probably anything else i've ever said so if you want your if you want if your improv does not sound good you don't know why it's not sounding good this is the reason right and besides obviously learning little licks and stuff like that i mean I can improv in a simple manner f f just strictly because I'm putting chord tones on downbeats and using connecting notes. So if I play a 2-5-1, right, I'm going to play a very, very simple 2-5-1, and it's going to sound good because of the general rule I just gave to you. Okay, here we go. 1, 2, oh, 1, 2, 3, 4. was so simple I wasn't using a lot of approach notes I used a couple of approach notes but I was targeting the chord tones just on the changes I mean you know let alone all the chord tones from within the measure if you just target chord tones on downbeats when the measure changes your improv is going to go from like a one to like a nine and your understanding of the approach of how that works is just gonna skyrocket. I mean, from there, it's easy. It's easy. And that's what you need to do. And the way you do this is by, you know, specific practice exercises that I don't have time to go over in this video. I mean, it's all the approach notes. It, you know, not to say that learning this is easy. The approach is easy. The work is hard. It takes a long time to, to do what I just did. I'm not saying that is easy. 
because it, it can take months to to learn all the chord tones like the back of your hand. You know, you got to you have to learn this stuff like writing, you know, a language like learning English. You have to learn that, you know, these are the notes of C minor seven, the chord tones. These are the chord tones of F seven. Right. You have to know that you can get how to get to any of the chord tones by voice leading. Right. Meaning I can go here. I can go here. Right. Or from here, I can go here. From here, I can go here. And then from the F7, I can go to B flat. If I'm here, I can go to here. Right. If I'm here, I can go. That has to be second nature to you so that you know all the movements. It's like it's like the Matrix. Right. Have you guys seen that movie? Uh, I'm dating myself right now. But, you know, in the Matrix, like at the end, Neo is just seeing code. Right. And he, so when the the bullets are shooting, he's not seeing bullets anymore. It's just like, it's like nothing to him. It's code. So I'm not saying you're playing, <laughs> it should sound like mathematically like a robot, but I'm saying this is the underlying structure that's going to actually help your sound and make you sound like you're improv, improvising, a, like jazz improv solo. All right. So there's, and this is how we do it. So again, what I just did was was a combination of using the chord tones but using different rhythmic approaches dependent upon where I was to get to certain notes. Now like I just demonstrated in the chromatic down from B B flat 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and not all the time in my solo, you know, your brain is working while you're soloing. You know, never never think it's not. I mean, you're always kind of thinking, "Oh, you know, I'm you're hearing thing it's you're always active in your head." So I'm hearing a line And, and like in my ear, I'm listening to what my heart and my mind wants to play. And, and my body tells me from through just playing, lots of playing, that I can play. E -da -da. So I can go down to the third, right? Da -da -de -da -da. Da -da -da. And again, now in this instance, right? One and two and three and four. Okay, I need to line up the chord tone on the downbeat of one, right? Because the chord's going to change. So that time it lines up on four. So in my head, if I want to target A, I need to figure out a way mathematically to get to A to delay my resolution so that I can play that A if that's what I want to play, uh, you know, on the downbeat. One and two and three. Sorry. One and two and three and four and one. Okay, so this all happens in an instant. I mean, like that. And, you know, so instead of going one and two and three and four and one, you could do that. There's so many possibilities, right? So you have all these approaches. It's like having an arsenal of different ways you can get to the A dependent upon a couple of factors. What you hear, where you want to go, where you're, maybe if you're looking at the keyboard. I mean, there's so many different things, but if you want to target that A, you need to know all these different approaches, and this is where the bebop approaches come into play. So I can go. I could do that, right? One and two and three and four and one. So I can delay my resolution. Maybe I can target the C first. Right? There's an approach right there to land on a chord tone, but I haven't gotten to the A yet. One and two and three and four. I can go one and two and three and four and one. So just hold. I can hold on notes. I can play 16th notes, right? So this is where the math of, of rhythms comes into play, right? Because you can hold on a note. You can delay the resolution if you want and not play anything. And that will lead you to a chord tone. That's what I recommend for beginners, right? One, two, three, four, and one. That's just the simplest thing you could do. You just hold one, two, three, four, and one. You can even make it simpler than that. You can go one, two, three, four, and one. You know, and then even simpler than that is just one, two, three, four, one. So it's about how we connect these chord tones using the approach notes, using the rhythms, right? And then making lines out of it. And as we start to complicate this more, right? One, two, three, four, one. One, two, three, four, and one, two, and, and one, right? One, two, three, four, and one. So we're adding a little extra each time. One, two, three, and four, and one, 
right? One, two, three, and four, and one. One, two, th uh, let me see. One, two, and three, and four, and one. Right now you start to hear the line form. You start to hear the bebop transform out of just the connection of these two notes. One, two, one, two, and three, and four, and one. And all that is, right, is me walking down the scale, making this resolution. Now the important part here, this is just a walk down. Remember, I'm targeting my A here. So I've practiced all my approach notes. So I know the different ways I can approach this A. And if you want to learn all your approach notes, again, go back to, um, I don't think I go over all of them, but uh, you can go back to the earlier podcast episode on how to play bebop. I think it's mid forties. I go over the approach notes, right? Half step below, chord scale above, stuff like that. All the approaches uh, are in jazz piano school, available to members, right? For all the different exercises. Okay, so playing this, I'm walking down my Dorian scale. Here's my approach. <clears throat> Chord scale below, half step below, to my third. One, two, and three, and four, and one, right? Now again, I can add more. I can say one, and two, and three, and four, and one. So I, I, this time, because of the mathematical duration of where I was in the line, I left out the A flat, because that's what I had to do. If we break this down even slower, one and now at this point when I start my line I'm I know I want to target the A but the end of the line is isn't set in my head yet I don't know right I, I'm figuring it out on the spot as I go like how I'm gonna resolve this to land on A on beat one one and two and three and I'm getting closer right now I'm gonna be on beat four I need to figure out how I'm gonna resolve this thing four now I, I know I have one more beat I need to play before I get to the A. Four and one. One and two and three and four and one. So it's usually around beat three and a half, right? Four, definitely four and a half. You should know how you're gonna kind of get to that thing. And maybe it's it's really not all the time. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an example. If you even if you mess up, so let's say you're on beat four. Uh, how, um, how am I gonna demonstrate this? There's delayed resolutions, right? So you could go one and two and three and four and oh, that would work too. <laughs> Let me see. One and two and three and four and one. So let's say you don't hit a chord tone on beat one. This is what I'm trying to say. Let's say you mess up your your approach, right? So you you know you didn't hit the chord tone, but because again, it's it's difficult, and sometimes I always, you know, I'm not always. Do I am I going to land on a chord tone, right? Sometimes you want a delayed resolution, so you might go, right? So the resolution happens later in the measure, which is also okay. So if you got that, that's very powerful too. What I'm trying to tell you is that no matter what you play, no matter what note you land on you can always figure out a way mathematically to to get back to the chord tone you're trying to approach but again the underlying structure has to happen where you want your you are focused on targeting approaches all right let's let's do a different um let's do a different example now okay uh, maybe we go so one and two. So I didn't start my line until beat two. I landed on the E flat and I put a one approach note into the E flat. One, one and two and three and four and one. Okay. Now here, chord scale below, half step below, chord scale above, uh, chord tone, right? That's our approach. And again, you want to practice all those approaches to all your chord tones for all your chords in every key. I mean, that that's what it takes. That's not easy. That's a lot of, I mean, it's easy if you have the printed exercises, right? It's easy to read it, practice it, and, be, and discipline yourself. Is it actually easy? No. You got to do it every day. You got to practice, and you got to put the work in. The work itself is theoretically easy, but doing the work, you know, it's like going to the gym. Do you know how to go to the gym and exercise and and you know, for some people, yeah, most of the time you, you know, you can go to the gym and get on a treadmill. Do you want to go to the gym and get a treadmill? Not really. Like we'd rather be sitting on the couch watching T 
TV, right? But if you want to get better at jazz piano, I mean, it's not theoretically hard. This is all you have to do. This is it, you know? And again, I mean, jazz piano school uh, makes it easy for you to do this because we give you all the exercises. That's why it's amazing. And it's also step by step. So we lead you up to the point where you're working on this stuff. So you're not just thrown in the fire, right? Anyway, one and two and three. Um, what did I play? Yeah, I think that's what I put. One and two and three and four and one. So I'm, I'm approaching the five of my F7 chord, right? So I'm going one and two and three and four and one. Now I can make this more complicated. I can I can do whatever you know. I can go one and two and three and and four e and a one one right. So I'm just trying to figure this out on the spot how to do how to make it more complicated. This demonstration. Right? You know, I could do that as well. I could do that. Right? So, what I'm doing right now is just, you know, I'm taking, I, I have this note I'm targeting and this note. And I'm using different approach notes and rhythm, rhythmic durations <clears throat> to figure out how I'm going to land on this on beat one. Now, I start off not knowing what my resolution is going to be here. And I, I'm figuring this out. So if I do this, one and two and three and four, chip four, pull it one. Now I know I need to get up here fast. One and two and three and four and one. I could just do that. Now again, something about jumping, right? If you're if you're trying to work on this, right, and you do, and you're you're stuck here. Let's say you pick, and a good exercise to practice this, guys, is to pick your chord tones out for two, five, one. So maybe you pick this, this, and this. So third, fifth, and seventh of your two, five, one. Pick three chord tones and target your chord tones. I would just start with two. Just start with what I'm doing right here, two, and then start to add in three, right? Now again, something with jumping. The jumps, that was not a jump, but it sounds a little bit better because it's more connected through smaller steps, right? The, the nice thing about approaches is that there's smaller steps to lead you into the, the chord tone. All those little minute details, in it, it creates flow rather than if I did this. I just jump up to that C. I mean, we, we could obviously do that, but the connection of lines and flow of your line is what really, we really need to work on too. So we need to start moving ourselves up towards that target note, then figure out how we're going to resolve it. One and two and three and four and one. <coughs> one and two, pull it three and four and one. I added a triplet in the beginning to get up there first. One and two, pull it three and four and one. And, and the, the thing about this, all these approach notes, again, that's what you just need to add to your vocabulary. Then you can choose whatever approach you want to target that note. So one and two, pull it three. Now I landed on three here, so I needed to figure out how to get to here in two beats. Right? Three. So I have and four and one. And four and one. So I have three notes I need to figure out how to resolve to beat this beat on beat one. Wait, what did I play? One and two pull it. Three and four and one. Right? So that's kind of tricky. That was a little bit more tricky. One and two pull it. Three and four and one. You can do that. One and two pull it. Three and four and one. I don't really like that. I like the half step below better. One and two pull it. Three and four. Um, one E and a two and three and no, sorry. One, uh, let me see. I'm trying to throw some 16 notes in. One E and a two and three and so one E and a two and three and four and one and one E and a one, one E and a two. It's hard to break it down. Like this is what you need to do. I mean, uh, I don't necessarily break it down. Like when I'm practicing, this is what I do. One E and a two and three and four. 
and one, one e and a two, and three and four and one. So you're again. So this is it's a process, right? Now I'm not recommending you just spend time <clears throat> just trying to connect chord notes, chord tones without knowing the approaches, because again, this is where the system comes into play, right? You can't just learn how to do this. I mean, I'm showing you so you understand, but the the actual process you take isn't to sit here and just do this because you don't know, well, some of you may know the approaches depending upon how well you know your approaches, right? So you need to learn all your chord tones. You need to learn all your approaches. You need to learn all your modes up and down, right? And at that point, when you study the underlying theoretical structure and foundation, and put them into tunes and practice it, then you can start to move into this, right? So again, I'm gonna target, so if I do a two, five, one, I'm gonna wrap up here, guys. If I, I'm gonna pick this note, I'm gonna pick the third, the third, and the fifth, right? So start out slow, one, two, and one, two, three, four. So I, I, I was up here, right? You know, and I had to get down to the F quickly. So I just added, I added a quicker rhythmic duration. I could do that, you know, or I could do. So depending upon where you are and, and, and you kind of just have to feel where the beat is. But again, that, that feeling of knowing where the beat is internally comes through slow practice. So start out slow. One, two, three, four. Right, there's our, our there's our fifth. Just doing a six here. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. Oh no, I'm approaching the fifth. Sorry. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one. So I had to go down to the E. Four and one, and I figured out that resolution. I wanted to go up. Right, so I had to add that resolution in. All right, so I'll speed it up just a little bit. One. Two, a one, two, three, four. So I had to do four do ba because I couldn't do do I could have done that. But again, these approaches, I'm figuring this out on the spot. You know, this is what I'm doing, but I'm just as I'm improvising, this stuff is all happening instantaneously. Right. I, I think I don't know if people really get that. That's that's all that's happening. I mean, it's so internalized to me at this point and other players that this happens. They don't they're not you're not thinking about it anymore. But this is the process you must take. And then eventually I'm not thinking about what chord tones to approach at all. Because I'm really, you know, my general focus is to hit chord tones, but I know there's so many different melodies and movements and uh, extensions and color tones I can use to resolve. You know, sometimes you heard me going up to the, you know, going up to the flat nine of the G7. So those color tones I can use uh, for approaches as well. Right. So I went up into the flat nine, sharp nine, half step below, chord scale above, back to the C. And if you do that, you just delay your resolution. I could have used that 11 on the C minor. I could have done that. No matter what note you hit, though, again, it can always be resolved later. Or even if you resolve before, you can add another resolution. So, so no, no matter where you approach the note, anything's possible. That's why... You need to learn all of this so you can so you can get yourself out of tricky situations, or if you don't, if you're not in a tricky situation, you can just flow nicely, right? up there
sorry. So, so again, and then you, it just takes off, right? So I had motifs go, obviously there's more to that, but I had motifs going, I had some reharms, but once you start out with my, per, my point is once you start out with that basic structure of just swinging, right? And keeping those chord tones on the downbeats, then you're giving yourself the potential to, to realize your, <clears throat> your dreams, right? To get into the spot where you just, you're just letting it flow. Just transcribing licks and pasting licks into tunes isn't going to, it's not going to allow you to do what I just did, right? Ever. And the only, the reason I'm, I'm telling you that straight up is because I went through the exact same thing. I did that. Like, use me, you know? Like, I, I'm a, I, I, I'm the test dummy. I tried to do that for so long in my career. It didn't work. And so I had to resort, like I knew all these licks. Now does it help me? Absolutely. Because I, I went back and I stripped everything bare in my, my playing and focused on this tedious work uh, that allows me to do that. Now all those licks and movements that I've taken, like the expressions, right, from certain um, horn players, pianists, bass players, like everybody, you can take stuff from everybody, the language, right? You can learn the language from everybody. You can still, you're, it's all, you're always learning. I'm still learning, still learning the language at nowhere, nowhere close. I heard Peter Martin do some fantastic things that, uh, you know, that I want to add to my language as well. Amazing stuff. You can always learn from everybody, but you want to start out being able to swing, make it sound like you're swinging in a simple fashion, hit those chord tones, then start to add, add the movements in afterwards, right? Don't worry about licks. Okay. That's, that'll come later. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's for later in your progression. And even, you know, it's funny because no matter where you are, I would say even the most intermediate players who, who can solo, right? I would say, and even me, I need to still work on basics of this types, these types of movements. You're never too good to go back to your foundation and work on these things. Like I, I need to work on this stuff too, to, to, to break through some barriers, right? To to get out of some some muddy points, right? So nice and slow. I'm gonna wrap. <coughs> excuse me, wrap it up here. When you're starting out, nice and slow, just focusing on the chord tones. One, two, <coughs> one, two, three, four. Some extensions there. some extensions and then I resolve to the E flat right so ah oh, crap I forgot what I played so again I I moved through my line there to the the, the through the C chord going for my approach into the F and I was up here and it had to resolve it somewhere and I wanted to stop to demonstrate but Right, these this stuff, this stuff is licks, right? That stuff is bebop language, but I don't have to use that form. I can do. I can break off. I can use the smallest segment of the licks now to to express my own my own self there it is again right then you 
go into motifs, right? It doesn't always have to be bebop language. Right, nice and simple. That's a reharm. scale right so it's not always bebop that you're using but that stuff leads to the different connections and movements through the tune that you're going to be able to use to 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 just complete that's that's the freedom that's the learning of the freedom right you're completely expressing yourself you're not using licks you're using the movements you're using words from a language right like learning vocab words the more vocab words you learn the the better able you're going to be able to express yourself in a language the more sentences you learn you're going to know sentences <clears throat> but you're not going to know the minute details of all the words in each sentence that will allow you to completely self-express yourself while talking in a language okay Woo! so sorry i hope i didn't blast your ears out there that was this is has been on my mind i hope this helps because it's a huge breakthrough once you understand this and uh, start to really discipline yourself to do this because it pays off guys right you're planting seeds now the the harvest isn't going to grow for a while right you got to be patient but you're setting yourself up for success okay with this style of educational cumulative educational learning now, is there more that goes into this that can relate to the the chord approaches? Like you saw me doing lots of reharm techniques. Uh, obviously, I'm playing solo piano. My left hand's doing a bunch. Uh, motifs, ideas, there, rhythmic ideas. There's so much more. But you're giving yourself the foundation by planting the seed now, structurally and directionally. So you're taking it step by step and moving through a process. You're not dumping a puzzle on the ground and just searching randomly for pieces this is what i did it my throughout my entire career this is why i created jazz piano school because after my years and years of playing like finally i finally felt confident i was teaching i taught so many private students for hours before my first student ever i'm going to tell you guys something i vowed never I vowed this to myself. This was my goal. And in my jazz piano education, I vowed never to let a student go home without knowing exactly what to practice, knowing where he was in his playing, and knowing where we were planning on going to and how exactly we were going to get there. Right? I laid out a plan for him. So he felt confident, confident, and he knew exactly how, the map. He knew the map. And I said, hey, listen, if you practice these things, we're going to do this next. That's going to lead to this. That's going to lead to this. And then you're going to be able to do exactly what I'm doing. Rather than, hey, just watch me play through, you know, Pentup House or Body and Soul and then figure out and then tell me what you like and then I'll show you what I'm doing. Like, that's, ah, man. You know, I get passionate about this because it happened to me. And I'm 32 and it, you know, I'm still not where I want to be at my playing, but, you know, it took, I wasted years, like a decade of time trying to do it that way. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. All right. So, <laughs> got some emotions going here. So, practice this. Okay. Practice it step by step. Discipline yourself. And uh, let me see. Let me see. I'm thinking about the... Yeah, you guys don't need practice materials for this. Again, target your chord tones. Do it in the simplest manner possible. Build up. Uh, build up to that. If you need the approach notes, I, I believe the approach notes are in Podcast 45 or something around there when I talk about bebop. I think I we give the uh, some of the approach notes away in practice exercises. So if you want that, go back to that episode. All right, guys. Uh, if you have questions, again, let me know. I'm always available. And, uh, again, all this stuff is in Jazz Piano School. <clears throat> so if you are looking to become a member, join the community, get all the practice exercises and step-by-step work through, uh, just let us know and we'll help you out with that. 
All right, I will see you in the next episode. And until that time, happy practicing. 